All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are live on YouTube. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box or um, we'll be having a discussion interaction during the session. So I highly encourage you to participate during the session and talk to our amazing, amazing presenter for today as we go along and they'll be addressed. And I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Tariq Muhammad. Tariq is a third year ophthalmology resident at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. He completed medical school at the Uni New York University, graduating one year early, and he received his undergraduate degree from the Johns Hopkins University. Now I'd like to request Dr. Muhammad to begin today's session. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me get my screen shared here. All right, so um, like I said, I'm, I'm Tariq Muhammad. I'm a resident here at the University of Maryland. I'm PG by three, which means I graduated med school three years ago. I'm about to start my fourth year after med school. Um, and so just as an overview of the presentation here, I wanna talk a little bit about things that are helpful, I think, to you all. Uh, so one is my path into medicine and you know things I did and things that I think could help and things that if you have questions about, we can talk about. Um, then I wanna talk a little bit about ophthalmology itself. And I know you had a, a, the presentation from ophthalmologists um, so I'm going to try to focus on some of the things that he didn't cover, um, and then maybe some overlap, and then I'll talk a little bit specifically about what life is as an ophthalmology resident, what it looks like day to day, week to week, um, and the sort of things we do in clinic and in the OR. Uh, and then if you have time, I think we should have time at the end, I can play a video, a uh, surgical video. I know the other um, doctor had shown some really good animations and things, but sometimes it's nice to see an actual video of a, of a resident, you know, in the operating room, seeing what they do and what, what it's like. Let's get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I am from Maryland. I grew up here. I went to River Hill. Anyone else is from Howard County. Uh, and then I went to Johns Hopkins University. I did biomedical engineering. Um, and I think my understanding is that most of you all are in undergrad. Uh, so that, that's something we, if you are interested, we can talk more about, you know, things I did as an undergrad um, and other, other, you know, why I chose that major, how I picked a major um, and the sort of extracurriculars I did, MCAT, all that stuff. Um, but then after, med after undergrad, I went to med school at N NYU, uh, and then I came back into my residency in Baltimore. So for ophthalmology, ophthalmology is three years, um, but you have to do one year of internal medicine beforehand. And recently, they sort of integrated the program. So you apply for a four-year program. Your first year is a lot of internal medicine. So that's, you know, being in the hospital, seeing patients in the emergency room, seeing patients on the hospital floors and in the intensive care units. Um, and it's you know, admitting patients, treating patients, discharging patients, that kind of stuff. Whereas ophthalmology is very much an outpatient-based specialty. So we don't have inpatients, we see outpatients in our clinic. So, you know, patients come in, we talk to them, we look at their eyes, we see what's going on, we see if we can help them. Um, and over the course of residency, you know, you start off as a junior resident and you kind of end up as a senior resident. And as you're learning things and becoming more confident surgically, then you have more responsibility um, so initially, when you see someone, you know, your supervising doctor, your attending physician will kind of be in the room with you, will say, oh, this is what you're looking at, this is what we're looking for, things like that. And as you go on, you'll start to see patients more by yourself. Um, and then at the very end, you'll be supervising some of the junior residents if they're doing those things. So it's, uh, it's nice to have that kind of built in. Um, and then looking forward, I put a, a fellowship in retro retinal surgery. So there's a couple of different fellowship options from ophthalmology. You don't need to do one. Um, if you do the one year internal medicine and three years in ophthalmology, you can get a pretty good job um, doing general ophthalmology pretty much across the US. Um, but if you want to practice in a bigger area or a place that's uh, in a bigger city or in an academic environment, it's helpful to get some extra training. And depending on the kind of person you are, you might want to be, become even more of a specialist uh, and deal with you know, more specific types of problems. Uh, so I'm hoping to apply for a, a fellowship, which is two years and in vitreo retinal surgery. And again, I'll talk a little more about what the different specialties do. Um, so at this point, does, is anyone, I'm assuming most of you are in undergrad, if you all have questions about what, what majors you're in, um, how I picked my major, um, if there were things I would have done differently or what sort of extracurriculars I did, um, we can talk about that now. If you all want to wait until the end, I think that's also fine. Hi, um, my name is Abdullah. I'm a third year uh, biomedical engineering student at UMass Amherst. Nice. And um, good choice, good choice to major. I'm, uh, yeah, it is a good choice. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious, like, I haven't really met a lot of other biomedical engineering um, pre meds uh, as often. And I've heard that it's actually 
it's better to be biomedical engineering for pre-med than biology. So, I mean, what do you know about that? Yeah, I think, I think there's an advantage to both. Um, the most important thing is picking something that you actually enjoy and that you like day to day are like happy doing the kind of studying because you have to study hard. And a lot of what you do, I think, regardless of your major is not going to be applicable in that school, directly applicable. Like um, a lot of engineering stuff I don't do, a lot of like the serious biology stuff. Yeah, medicine is based off of it, but like you don't really use it day to day. Uh, what I liked about engineering, and there are a decent amount, I think biomedical engineering is just a little bit uncommon, but at least at Hopkins, probably about a third of the people went to med school in my major, um, which isn't a lot, but it's a good bit. Um, the advantage is, I think, having an engineering mindset of thinking about problems, uh, sort of from like first principles and using, you know, basic physics and other things to kind of build, build up and solve complex problems is something that really helps you, especially if you have, a, have an eye on doing towards doing research. Um, and so you can kind of keep that towards the back of your head. You know, when, when people go into medicine, a lot of people do private practice and they end up doing a lot of clinical volume. And if that's what you want to do, that's great. Um, but they, people have a bit experience in biology and they do some kind of basic science or lab work. Um, then that sets them up for that kind of research if that's something they're interested in. If you do biomedical engineering, I think that opens a lot more avenues for you because then there's a lot of imaging research, a lot of robotics research, a lot of you know, machine learning research, a lot of other things that you have that kind of background if you're interested in. To, to help you get that experience later on. Um, so let's uh, keep going here. Thank you for the question. Um, outside of work, this is a pretty brief slide. I do wanna mention, I'm not gonna talk much about this, any of this stuff, uh, but especially in college, as you're kind of figuring out what you wanna do, <clears throat> I feel like college is a time where you really start to get a lot of uh, personal freedom in terms of how much time you have to do things, how much time you have to structure your schedule. And it's really, really important as soon as you can to start making like healthy habits um, and not just, you know, focusing entirely on your schoolwork or like whatever kind of career things you want to do. Um, because your career is always, always going to be only going to be just part of your life. Uh, you're still going to have things outside of your work that you want to have that can make you happy and, you know, you enjoy doing. Uh, so for me, there's just a couple of things that I like to do and that I've, I've been doing um, since I was in college and it becomes harder, you know, the more busy you get. Um, but if you don't take the time to really like find things that you like to do and explore and try new things when you're in college, then you're not, it's going to be harder to try and explore and try and find new things, but it's easier to, to continue doing things that you've already know that you like. Um, so that's really my point of including this, this slide. The other point of including this is in your application process, as I'm sure you've seen when you apply to college, uh, when you apply to medical school, people are going to want to know that you're doing things outside of medicine as well. Um, and not just like kind of scholastic activities like research and volunteering, but things that are just genuinely like fun and interesting and things that you can talk about. Um, and a lot of times people come to me and they're like, oh, like I want to like start this, like I have it on my application. Um, but I think the way I would look at it is, you know, try to find things that you like doing. And then because you like doing them, you'll have experience with them. Um, and you can even like like volunteer in organizations or participate in different groups and kind of like make it a little more legitimate for your application. And then when you apply, you have those things to talk about. And that there's two verbs. There's one of them is you actually find something you like doing. And then also when you apply, it looks good. So I think you should try to do them together and not try to do one instead of the other. <clears throat> uh, so that's a little bit about um, my background and my approach to things. Now we can shift gears and talk more about ophthalmology specifically. Uh, and so for this part, it's, it's really just to kind of get a sense of what ophthalmologists do and um, try to apply some medical principles to ophthalmology. Now, even in medical school, you don't really learn that much about ophthalmology. Um, maybe you have like a day or two lectures on it. Maybe you send a day or two in clinic, but unless you really want to, you're not going to get any specific experience. Uh, so I know the other presentation, it was really good and focused on a lot of specific ophthalmic diseases. Um, so what I want to do is two things. One is go over a few of those. Um, but then also talk a little bit about what we call the orbit and nexus. So the eyeball is surrounded by a lot of important structures. Um, and it's a lot of interesting anatomic configurations. And when you talk about an ophthalmologist, there are a lot of different specialties you can do, right? So there's a general ophthalmologist, which focuses on cataract surgery um, and managing some other diseases like glaucoma uh, or dry eye disease. And those are generally around the eyeball itself, or what we call the globe. Um, but when we talk about the orbit, there's all these structures surrounding the eye that other ophthalmologists can deal with. So for example, you have the optic nerve. Um, can you all see my mouth here? I'm assuming you can. 
No, we don't see your mouse. Oh. Uh. You can use the pointer um, on the bottom left. Do you see that? You can also annotate on Zoom if you look at view options at the top. Yeah, let me try that. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So you have the optic nerve, which comes off here. The optic nerve comes directly off the brain and connects to the eye, and that's what how vision goes from the eye to the brain. Then you have a bunch of other nerves called cranial nerves. So you know you have nerves that control, you know, whether your hand moves up or down, or you how to close your fingers or walk left and right, you know, your feet. You have cranial nerves, which are the nerves that go from inside your brain to all the organs inside your head. And so there are multiple of those, uh, including cranial nerves three, four, and six, uh, and five. And those control the movement of the eye, uh, three, four, and six do, by controlling the muscles around the eye. And then you have cranial nerve five, which controls the sensation around the eye um, and does a lot of other things outside the face too, but around the eye. And then cranial nerve seven, which isn't shown in this picture, uh, comes from the brain and controls, helps move the muscles of expression around your eye, including closing your eyelid. Um, the other things that are drawn here, that are shown here, are all the blood vessels, which are labeled in red. So you have the internal carotid artery shown here, and you have the external carotid artery, which isn't shown here, but actually connects with a lot of these vessels from the outside. Um, so if you've ever felt your pulse in your neck, that's where the carotid artery is. It comes off of the heart, goes straight up the neck. You have one on either side. And as it comes up across the jaw, it splits and part of it goes inside the head and part of it goes outside the head. So part that goes inside, the first branch that comes off as soon as it gets inside the head is called the ophthalmic artery. And it's actually pretty small, um, but it travels again inside the orbit. It supplies the eyeball and it supplies all the areas around it. So you can see the blood vessel branches and it goes, some of it goes straight into the eye. Some of it goes to some of the structures around the eye, goes to the eye muscles. Um, and then some of them do what they call anastomos which is it connects to another set of arterial blood supply. So typically blood flows, heart, artery, vein, back to heart. Um, but it's not really that straightforward because a lot of times there's blood vessel networks. So there's a bunch of arteries that are all interconnected, connected and a bunch of veins are all interconnected and then they connect to each other. Um, the other thing that's shown here is in blue is the veins, which is the same thing, but in reverse. The veins follow sort of a parallel system. Um, so the same thing in your neck, you have what's called the jugular vein. Um, and you have the internal and the external jugular. And the same way, these, uh, <clears throat> these blue veins go back and connect to the internal jugular, but you have the same, the same veins that you train in some of the eyelids and things that go uh, to the external jugular. And then the last thing I wanna show here, which I have um, another slide going into a little more detail, is these, these things here, which are the eye muscles. Um, so I'm not sure if you all know anyone who has, or seen anyone, um, it's actually not uncommon, who is what we call maybe cross eye or business or squint, there's a bunch of different ways for it, but some of his eyes don't line up. And that's an entire ophthalmic op specialty by itself called strabismus. Uh, and what happens is there's six extractive muscles and they each attach in specific places on the eye. And depending on how they pull, they can control the movement. And it's really important because eyes need to move together so that you don't have double vision and that you get good stereopsis that you get, which is a, a major part of um, stereo vision, depth perception. Any questions about all this? Okay, let's keep going here. So talking a little bit more about the orbit, um, you know, the eye socket, which is, you know, uh, medically known as the orbit is formed by a sort of cone of four of, of the bones. Um, and so it's a pretty rigid area where the eyeball sits. Um, and it's important anatomically wise, because this is something that can be disrupted when we're talking about trauma or other, other diseases. Uh, and the kind of person is a type of ophthalmologist to focus on this is what's called an oculoplastic specialist. Um, so they focus on diseases around the eye, including the orbit. Um, and there are other medical specialties that deal with this. So for example, if you're a plastic surgeon, you can do a face surgery fellowship and kind of do kinds of things around the orbit. Um, ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctors sometimes do things. And also OMFS, oral maxillofacial surgeons who are um, it's the type of residency you can do after dental school. Um, but this is something we need to know as well. Uh, and a couple of key features here, you can see that um, in the back of the eye, let me get my annotation tool again. So this here is where the optic nerve comes in. So again, you have the brain 
which is behind the eye, and you have the eye, which is in front of the orbit, and all of the things that go between the brain and the eye need to be connected. There needs to be some small area for it to go through. So the optic nerve comes through this, what we call optic foramen. Then you have another area here, which a lot of the other cranial nerves come through and a lot of the blood vessels come through. And you can see on this bottom picture, it's actually reversed. So this top one, this is where the nose is here. Um, but on the other side, this is where the nose is. So this is, a, I guess, the right eye or left eye. Um, they color coded each of the different bones that make, make up the orbit. So on the outside, you have what's called the zygoma, which forms up really your cheekbones. So when someone says, you know, they have high cheekbones or something, they're really talking about the bottom part of the zygoma. Um, then you have the maxilla here. And the maxilla is a big bone that goes all the way across your face and forms actually the top of your mouth. Um, and it's where the top of your teeth come, the, the teeth on the top of your mouth come out of. But on the other side of that is the bottom of the eye socket. Uh, and then the last sort of major bone is the frontal bone, which forms most of your forehead. And those three really form the rim of the orbit. <clears throat> or in other words, if you follow the orbit, the rim you know, along the front part, they connect and, and form that anatomic barrier. If you look in the back, there's a couple of different other bones that play a role. The sphenoid, which has a very uh, important role inside the, inside the head, intracranial under the brain uh, at the skull base. And then you have a couple of different bones sort of nasally on that side. Um, and again, like I was saying, this is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, this bone at the bottom here and this bone in the middle are very thin. And so oftentimes if there's any kind of trauma, I know some of you have shattered, uh, shattered in shock trauma. You, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, if someone gets hit in the eye, someone falls, uh, someone is in a motor vehicle collision, um, these bones can fracture very often. A lot of times those fractures can be small and don't mean much, but if they're big enough, they can uh, cause the eye to sink down or sink in, um, or they can cause the eye not to line up properly. So if you have double vision uh, or you know, ophthalmos, those are reasons that you may need to do surgery to repair that. That surgery is done by taking a new metal plate, lifting up the eye, kind of sliding the plate into place and then screwing it in so it, it reforms the orbit. Um, in a special situation, you can have what's called uh, entrapment. So the eye muscles, which I drew, let me try this, which I drew and they kind of come across like this, because they come in each side. If the bone under the eye muscle breaks and pinches the muscle, it can cause that muscle to die in that area. Um, and that's actually a little bit more of mercy and it can be done within 24 hours to repair that, remove the muscle, make sure it's not trapped and then repair the, the floor like I talked about. Um, the other reason why this orbit is important among other reasons um, is that because it's a bony structure, it's uh, susceptible to compartment syndrome or compression from the inside. So if there's anything growing in there that's not supposed to be there and it's bigger or bigger is bigger than it's supposed to be, it'll press on the eye and compress on the optic nerve and that can cause permanent vision loss. So you may see that if someone has uh, a swelling around the eye or has an infection called orbital cellulitis, they can get an abscess in there or the area can just get really swollen with infected material. And that's an emergency it needs to be treated, it can be drained. Uh, or if someone again has a trauma, you can have what's called a retrobulbar hemorrhage. So all those blood vessels that I showed you in the other picture, um, if they start to bleed uh, after a trauma, then the blood can push the eye forward and really build up in the space. And that causes again, permanent vision loss. And so the treatment for those, if the pressure is so high, what you have to do is actually cut the eyelid on the side and allow the eyelid to open up to give you some more space for, for that area to decompress. Uh, this is a better view of the eye muscles that I talked about. Um, I know I said I would come back to this. And I think this is a really fascinating part. And this has some overlap with neuro uh, so with neurology. Um, there's especially an ophthalmology called neuro ophthalmology, which is dealing with, like I said, all those cranial nerves. Um, and so that matters here because each of those cranial nerves has a specific pattern for connecting each one of these muscles. So you'll see you have six muscles. Um, there's one muscle, there's four muscles sort of at each quadrant, superior, lateral, inferior, and medial. And that's sort of how we label things in medicine. And then you have two oblique muscles that insert at a funny angle, um, the superior oblique here and the inferior oblique here. And so that gives you six muscles. And you might think that, um, you know, if you had four that were sort of like the four main ones, you can pull the eye in each direction. Uh, so why would you need more than that? Well, actually your eye needs to be able to rotate um, because if you, for example, rotate your head one side, then your eyes actually have to rotate to line up this way because not only do the images have to be lined up up and down on left and right, but they have to be torsionally lined up. Um, so you have these extra muscles and it becomes kind of interesting if someone has a problem and they come in and they say, I'm having double vision 
you can say, okay, are you seeing double or two images side by side? Are you seeing two images up and down? Are you seeing two images that are rotated next to each other? Um, and based on that, and you can do a lot of exam things to figure out exactly which muscles are weak, which muscles may be trapped, which muscles may not have, uh, may not be functioning properly to isolate which problem it is uh, and tell you, you know, if one of the nerves is the issue or if the muscle itself is the issue, then you can talk about eye muscle surgery. Let me clear this for a second. <clears throat> um, so in eye muscle surgery, what they do is you can make a small incision on the surface of the eye and then you can remove the insertion of the muscle on the eye, measure exactly where you want to move it back and reattach it. And you can think about this. This is very much like, I'm sure you're all taking basic physics um, and things. It's very much like a, a vector. You have a circle and you have something attached here. And depending on how much of a, a vector you have, it causes less torque if it's further from the surface. So if you move a muscle further back away from causing less of a, of a moment arm, um, then it's gonna be weaker. Uh, if you can shorten the muscle, that'll make it stronger. And you can also move the muscle up and down. You can move it left and right um, to give you some really kind of complex surgical things to reposition the, the eye muscles after if they, need, if they need to based on their double vision. Uh, and I, I talked about oculoplastic specialists before dealing with things around the orbit, like the, eye, the, the, the bones of the orbit, but they also deal with eyelids and all of the things sort of around the front of the eye as well. Um, so this is a great picture. All these pictures, by the way, are from our, our textbook. Um, when you're in ophthalmology, they have a 13-part a textbook, um, and they kind of go through each specialty, and they say, these are all things you need to know about eyelids. These are all things you need to know about glaucoma. These are all things you need to know about pediatric ophthalmology. Um, so in the intro book has a lot of really good anatomic pictures. So I took these to, to use to show you because I think they're, they're good. And it's a lot of detail, obviously, but again, this is just to get a, a, an idea of the kind of things we, you have to learn uh, when you're studying ophthalmology as a resident. And just to get an idea when I talk about some of the surgeries, you know, to understand what's going on. Um, so the eyelid uh, has a very interesting structure here. One of the muscles that I talked about um, that controls the, let me put my, so this muscle here is the superior rectus muscle. It was one of the ones I said that helps pull the eyeball up. Um, but just above that, you have a muscle that comes from the same source and is connected to the same cranial nerve, but actually connects to the eyelid. Um, so what lifts your eyelid, if you notice if someone has double vision or something like that, you may notice their eye is also, the eyelid is also droopy, what we call ptosis. Um, that's because they share a similar source in terms of innervation. Um, but there's a lot of other important structures around the eyelid. So the eye itself, um, you have the skin coming from the top, then you have the orbicularis muscle. And that's the muscle I said that helps control facial expression, helps you close your eyes. That's controlled by a specific cranial nerve. Um, and then below that, you have the levator palpebrae, which is that muscle that helps lift the eyelid. And then you have something called the tarsus, which is a, it's kind of a dense connective tissue that forms the border of the eyelid. So you'll notice that your eyelid is very thin, but at the bottom it has this kind of thick, kind of thick part, um, kind of strong connective tissue. Uh, and that forms the border. And if you zoom in on the surface of the eyelid, there's again, a very uh, important anatomic structure where you have, I'll draw it here on the side. It forms a nice square edge. So if this is where the eyeball is here, it forms a nice square edge. You have um, the tarsus, you have the conjunctiva, you have the bricularis and you have the skin. And so in the skin, you know, skin is normal skin. It's very thin on the eyelid. There's no fat. Um, Underneath that, you have the orbicularis, which just that is a muscle, and that helps um, helps you close your eyelid in case someone you know something comes to your eye, you reflex, you can close it, but you're going to blink normally, and you're going to squeeze your eyes voluntarily if you need to. And at the bottom of that, you have your eyelashes coming out. Um, then behind that, you have the tarsus, which, like I said, is a very dense connective tissue, and the tarsus has a couple other important structures in it. Um, one of which is a, a series of oil glands called meibomian glands. And I showed you in the other picture, the lacrimal gland, which helps produce liquid tears, but your tear film actually has a, a, a couple of parts to it. There's mucin uh, made by mucus in the goblet cells made by the conjunctiva, which is that, you know, I'm sure you all have heard of someone with pink eye or something. That's, that's the conjunctiva being involved. That's like the skin on the surface of the eye. Um, but there's also an oily component, which helps stabilize the tear film. And that can be a common problem that can be treated uh, if you have dry eye disease or meibomian gland disease. Um, and those meibomian glands are located within the tarsus. And then at the very bottom, you have the conjunctiva, 
um, which, as I said, helps cover the eye and it actually folds over and covers the inside surface of the eyelid. Um, the, other, the other important structure that's in the eye that's not really shown here uh, is the tear drainage system. So the tears are produced and they need to be drained. And so you have two um, tiny little canals or canaliculi in the upper and lower eyelid. And they're right on the inside. Um, and when you blink, when you squeeze your eyes, they, they compress a little bit and it helps tears flow out. They drain out into the, into the back of the nose. If you have problems tearing there, then what they can do, um, this is something in oculoplastics people do, but it's a common problem in kids that pediatric ophthalmologists often do it too. Um, they can put a small cannula in there, drain it with fluid, and if they need to, they can put a stent, a small little silicone tube to help keep that tear drain system open. In the situation of the eyelid, the position is very important. So your eyelid um, can be too high, it can be too low, it can be rotated in or it can be rotated out. Um, so again, if this is your eye here, if your eyelid, for example, let's say you have a cut here and it gets scarred, then your eye can rotate in and that'll be bad because then the eyelashes can be scratching up the surface of the eye. Um, in a similar way, the eye, I'll draw the lower lid here, can be rotated out. So then you're not gonna be able to close your eye properly. Or if your eyelid is too low, you still may not be able to close your eye. And if your eyelid is too high, um, then you know you won't be able, to, if, if it comes down too far in front of the eye, then you won't be able to see because it's physically blocking your eyelid. Um, so these are all things that, again, when you're studying medicine, you realize how many things can really go wrong. Uh, and that if you're like, thankful, thankfully healthy enough to not have any of these problems, you won't really realize. Um, but each of these problems can be fixed surgically. And it's, it's, that's part of what oculoplastics do. So they can, you know, change the position of the eyelid. They can change where this eye muscle inserts um, to raise and lower it. Um, you can also make the eyelid tighter or looser to help resolve some of these problems if the eyes rotated in or rotated out, which is called entropion or extropion of the eyelids. All right, and so this is, you know, when people talk about ophthalmology and things about the eyes specifically. So I do wanna mention a couple of things here. Um, and I think a, a, a good way to go through this is talking about the different specialties so I, we talked about two of them already, strabismus um, or pediatrics. Um, those are the people who deal with eye muscles and eye alignment. And the surgeries they typically do help reposition the eye muscles like I showed you. Um, you have plastics who deal with things in and around the orbit. If you have a tumor, if you have uh, an infection, if you have bleeding, uh, or if you have eyelid issues, the eyelid malpositions, those can be fixed surgically. Um, but then when they're talking about the inside of the eye, there are a number of different parts and a number of different subspecialties as well. So you have this clear area on the very top of the eye, it's labeled as the cornea. Um, then it, you have the iris, uh, which is again, cut from the side. That's the colored part of the eye that moves up and down, uh, the colored part of the eye that you can see. Um, then right behind that, you have a natural lens. And then there's a little bit of empty space filled with this, uh, this gel called the vitreous. And then the back of the eye, you have the retina, which is like a little wallpaper plaster to the back that actually physically or chemically catches the light. Uh, and then all that light is collected and sent to the optic nerve to the brain. And I showed that other picture of the optic nerve. The optic nerve travels, uh, you know, back all the way into the skull. Um, but this is just the head of it. So when you're looking at the eye, when you're examining the eye, uh, we can see all of these things. And it's, you know, except for, I guess, some of the, some of the stuff right behind the iris. Um, and that's one of the really nice things about ophthalmology. You can really visualize your problem. Um, and it's nice to be able to see something yourself and say, okay, this is where the problem is and figure out how to fix it. And then fix it surgically. Um, it's very rewarding to have that kind of direct, you know, uh, treatment resolution of the problem. Uh, so again, cornea issues. Um, if your cornea has a scratch, if it has a bad infection, if it's degenerating and it's getting very swollen, those are all the things that cornea specialists deal with. Um, and the main sort of surgery they do are corneal transplants, which is a very interesting thing. It's actually one of the earliest transplant surgeries that were ever done. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a transplanted cornea from the cadaveric body. Um, so someone who recently passes away, they send someone, um, if they're an organ donor, as they evaluate some of the other organs, they evaluate their eye and see if their cornea is reasonable for transplantation. Um, and you can, trans you can transplant, the cornea itself is 500 microns, roughly. So the initial surgery was transplanting the whole cornea, what they call a penetrating keratoplasty, or a full thickness corneal transplant. Um, but as people uh, developed their surgical tools, then they became better at transplanting thinner and thinner materials. So Currently, you can transplant just the endothelium, just the very inside layer of the cornea, and that's about um, 50 microns. Uh, or you can transplant the anterior layer, 
And you can be very clever in which sort of layers you transplant and how you do it. Um, the cornea is also where keratoderm refractive surgery takes place, which is a, a subspecialty um, that's often lumped in with cornea. And that's like if anyone's had laser eye surgery, LASIK or PRK, um, what they do is they reshape the stroma or the main body of the cornea to basically shave a lens into it so that you don't have to wear contacts or glasses anymore. Um, behind that, you have this, uh, the lens. And the lens is where the cataract is. So if someone has a cataract, that's their lens. It's the same thing. Uh, when you're born with a lens, it's very clear, it's very pliable, and it actually um, can move. <clears throat> it can move and change shape, and that changing shape helps you focus near and far away. So if you notice, if your parents maybe can't read up close anymore, they need reading glasses, is because their lens has become hard and cloudy and can't focus up close anymore. Um, and so cataract surgery is the, the surgery where we make a small cut through the cornea, remove the lens using a phaco emulsification probe. It's kind of a, a modified ultrasound device that breaks up the lens, removes it, and we put in a clear plastic lens. Uh, it's a very successful surgery. It's actually the most common surgery that ophthalmologists do in the U.S. and worldwide. I think they do 5 million in the U.S. and, and 30 million or something worldwide. Um, and I bring that up because as a general ophthalmologist, that's really the main thing that you'll be doing, the main surgery you'll be doing. As a resident, that's the main surgery we're trained to do. Uh, at the University of Maryland, we do, you know, 180 or something like that surgeries. Um, some places, at most residencies, you do some, I guess, between 100 and 200, um, which is by far the most surgical procedure that you do. Um, it's a very interesting surgery. And if you have time, this is the surgery I'm gonna show you at the end. Uh, so moving on from that, in the, in between the iris and the lens, uh, between the iris and the cornea, you have the parts of the eye that produce fluid and drain fluid inside the eye. So we talked about the tear production, tear drainage, that's for the surface of the eye. There's also aqueous production, aqueous drainage, which happens inside the eye. And if any of that drainage pathway is messed up, the pressure can go up and you can develop glaucoma. Um, which again, I know something the other doctor talked about, um, but there are a lot of new surgical techniques where you can put in drains, tubes, um, or make openings called trabeculotomies or um, trabeculoplasties uh, to help affect the drainage. And that's what glaucoma specialists do. <clears throat> glaucoma at its core affects the optic nerve, which is all the way in the back of the eye, but the treatment is to affect the eye pressure and all those things are in the front of the eye. So cornea specialists, glaucoma specialists, and cataract specialists are all kind of what we call anterior segment surgeons. Um, and if you're an anterior segment surgeon, you may be doing a little bit of each, or you may specialize more into one or the other, depending on if you want to do a fellowship in corneal glaucoma, or if you want to be a general and still focus on one of those things. Um, and then if you go into the back of the eye, there's two really important st structures that we're talking about. One is the retina, which like I said, is a very thin connective sheet, a uh, very thin transparent sheet of tissue. Um, and it's neural tissue, it's made up of nerve cells. Uh, and at one end of the nerve cells is something that senses light, the rods and cones. So when they sense light, they send off an electrical signal. That signal is connected through multiple neural layers within the retina, um, causing some sort of internal processing. And then that signal is sent through the brain. And there are many, many diseases that affect the retina. Uh, the most common ones are diabetes, um, vein occlusions, which are often related to hypertension, high blood pressure, or macular degeneration. And I'm sure you all know many people have those diseases. Um, the other retinal disease that is commonly talked about is retinal detachment. And that's when you have a tear in the retina and some fluid gets underneath and the retina detaches. Uh, and there are different surgical approaches to the retina. If the retina detaches, you can make a small incision on the white part of the eye, drain the fluid underneath, and then put on something that compresses the eye so that the retina reattaches. Or you can go inside the eye, remove all the vitreous, which is kind of like I said, a gel. It's mostly collagen. It's mostly water, um, but with a lot of collagen that makes it a gel and then you can retouch the retina from the inside. And then the optic nerve is not something that surgically can really, there's much treatment that can be done because it's, it's like the brain and once it's damaged, or you have a stroke or something, surgery isn't gonna help, unfortunately. Um, but it is an important specialty. And there's, again, like I said, neuroophthalmologists who deal with all the nerves that surround the eye. So that includes the eye muscles and um, eyelids and things like that, but they also really focus on optic nerve, which is, which is one of the major cranial nerves. Um, so at this point, uh, if we can talk more about you know, specific ophthalmology things, um, but I wanted to transition and talk a little bit more specifically about my schedule, what life is like as a resident um, in ophthalmology to give you guys an idea. Because I know that's one of the things that um, when you're thinking about if medicine is right for you, you, you may hear things about how the schedule is and some doctors are unhappy. Um, and I think you should listen to all those people because everyone has a good perspective. Um, but you also try, should try to get details about like, you know, if someone doesn't like it, what are the things they don't like? And is it their schedule they don't like? Is it things that can be changed? Or is it things about their specialty in, in specific? Or is it things about 
you know, maybe they just didn't have the right expect, maybe their expectations didn't match what they're doing. Um, so I like to give details, or I would like to give details um, so that you can kind of make your own decision and see. It's really hard, you know, when I was in, my, in your position and I tried to meet with people to talk with them, they would tell me the things and I would be like, oh, like, I guess that seems fine, like working overnight or, you know, working nights for a week or being on call for a couple of days. Um, but definitely doing it is a different experience. So you just never know until you do it, honestly. But it is good to at least have an idea. And if you're able to, to, to shadow and spend time um, just to, to see, it's helpful. So as a resident, um, medical school, to back up, medical school is, is very similar to undergrad in the first two years. You're pretty much in classes for you know four to five hours a day. And you spend most of the other time studying. And there's a little bit of other, like you go to the hospital once a week or something. Um, but overall, it's pretty similar. Then towards the end of medical school, you, you kind of, your schedule becomes pretty much like that of a resident. You start working in the hospital, it's full time. Um, and depending on which rotation you are, you could be working as much as like 12 hours a day, six days a week, or it could be something more relaxed, like, like a regular 40 hour work week. Um, so this is my schedule as a resident in ophthalmology now. You work five days a week, about 10 hours. So it's roughly seven to five. Um, some days is more, some days is less. Around one day a week, we're on call, and I'll talk a little more about call in a second, and one weekend a month. The average is about 50, 60 hours a week. Sometimes if you have to work a full weekend and you have to work a couple nights during the week, you can get close to 70 and 80. Um, as you all know, there's, or you may know, there's a, a, a limit, a legal limit to crossing 80 hours a week, averaged over a month. Um, so if you cross, so generally speaking, you don't cross that, but you can get close. Um, 40 hour, and for a 40 hour week, which is, I guess what some people consider typical is nine to five, five days a week. Um, and for ophthalmology specifically, you operate one day a week. And as a senior, it's going to be one to two. Um, in general, I think for ophthalmology, this is pretty standard, you know, regardless of where you go. This varies a lot based on residency. Um, and one of the nice things about ophthalmology is, for example, we don't have inpatient. So we don't have to have someone there like in-house overnight, every night. We don't have like a night float service. Um, that is something you have to do as an intern. Um, we also routinely don't, we don't work most weekends. There are a lot of weekends you do have to work, but you're off most weekends, which again is something I don't think you get in other specialties. Um, when you're in attending, uh, which is after you finish residency, you start practicing by yourself. Uh, you, your, your schedule, if you're, a, I think, a general ophthalmologist working in private practice is going to look pretty much the same. You take less call, um, but you're still going to be working about five days a week, probably 10 hours a day, and you're still going to operate one or two days a week. Now, depending on what you want to do personally, career-wise, you can work more, you can see more patients, and that can, that can be good if you want to build up your practice, build up your skill, and you can make more money that way. Um, or if you want to work less and you have other things you want to focus on, you can definitely work part-time as an ophthalmologist. There are a couple of ophthalmologists we work with that work, that work you know, three days a week and the other two days at all. Um, you take a pay cut, but again, it's a kind of a pro-con. You get some benefit by having the extra time available. Um, and then if you're working at a university or if you're interested in research and teaching, you can do the same thing. You can cut back on the, the clinical time, um, but then you can apply for grants or university funding to pay you to do teaching and research so that you're still working, uh, you know, a good bit a week, but you're not doing clinical care every day. You may be doing two days in clinic, one day in the OR, two days during research. And really you have a good bit of flexibility in how you make your schedule ultimately. You know, you can't really like come out of residency and say, I want to do this, this and that. Um, but you can build your, your goals and, and get to how you want your schedule to be with time. Um, so I want to go, I'll, I'll talk about a specific day, um, but I want to go through sort of our general clinic flow as well. So an example clinic for us, uh, we spend a lot of time at the Veterans Hospital um, in Baltimore. Um, so we'll have about 40 patients scheduled for the day. There'll be three or four residents scheduled to one attending. We'll each see about eight to 10 people. Um, Perhaps. Well, it depends. You can see sometimes like four or five people in a half day or as up to eight and 10 in a half day. Um, but what do we really do? You know, someone comes in, you sit down, you've all been to the, been to the doctor. We talk to the patient, we look at their notes, um, and then we spend a good bit of time examining the patient. Uh, we use a slit lamp, we have different special lights and tools and lenses. We take pictures and we look at all those things. Um, and we can really break it up into two issues. You know, you have new patients or patients have sudden problems. So someone walks in and say, my eye hurts. You have to figure out what's going on. Or someone walks in and, you know, you know, they have a history of glaucoma or macular degeneration, some kind of chronic disease that they've been followed for and treated for. And you have to assess, is this disease under control? Is, is, are there any new problems? Um, are there any treatment changes we should make? Um, 
And so between those two things, you, you can then decide what sort of, um, you know, what the assessment, what your assessment of the problem is, you know, what is, what is the problem? Is the problem controlled? Is it not controlled? And what treatments you recommend? Uh, and then there are a lot of in-office procedures you can do in ophthalmology. Um, one of the major advantages of ophthalmology is that you get to do a little bit of everything. You get to do some diagnostics, you get to do imaging, you get to do medical treatment, and you get to do surgical treatment. Um, and that's not something other specialties do. Uh, it's a big, big plus of ophthalmology. In office, we can do a lot of procedures. We do injections inside the eye, injections around the eye. We can do steroids, we can do antibiotics, um, things like that. We also use a lot of lasers. Uh, I think the other doctor mentioned this. We can use lasers to treat glaucoma, um, lasers to treat uh, other pacifications inside the eye, or lasers to treat retinal diseases. Um, and those are things that, again, come in during the clinic, and you can kind of mix them up um, depending on what you want. Some patients, some doctors want to do all their injections on one day, all their lasers on one day, and all their like non-procedural clinic visits on another day. Um, other doctors like to have it all mixed up. And it's a little bit up to you, uh, you know, when you're in attending, how you want to structure those things. Um, and the specifics, like I said, depend on which specialty you're in. If you're in pediatrics clinic, you can spend a lot of time looking closely at eye muscles and eye alignment um, and th thinking about strisma surgery. Uh, if you're in general clinic, you may spend more time doing refraction, measuring if someone needs glasses um, and looking at the cataracts and doing cataract measurements. Uh, if you're in retina, you're going to do a lot more injections and lasers. Uh, in glaucoma, you're going to spend a lot of time looking at imaging and testing, checking uh, visual field tests, nerve scans, um, and analyzing you know, the status of someone's glaucoma. Uh, we mentioned this as we're going through uh, in the different anatomic areas of the kind of operating procedures we do. By far, the most common surgery is cataract surgery, which, like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about later. Um, but depending on the specialty you do, uh, you can do different types of surgery, either as an orbits for plastic surgeons, extract the muscles, again, for pediatrics or strabismic surgeons, um, operating in the front of the eye, what we call the anterior segment, and in the back of the eye. Um, in general, uh, our surgeries are relatively short. Um, in some general surgical and neurosurgical procedures, you know, it can take hours and hours to really get to the area you want to operate on. Um, and then you have to spend a lot of time managing the patient afterwards. They have to be admitted. Um, one of the advantages of ophthalmology is because the eye is relatively easier to access, um, the patients come in that day, they leave that day, the surgery itself takes about an hour maybe. Um, and you can do, if you're a busy surgeon, you can do 40 cases a day. Um, if you're a beginner surgeon, you'll do a couple. And depending on what your operating flow looks like, you'll probably do somewhere in between 20 to 30. Um, and again, it's a little bit up to you if you want to operate a lot, if you want to operate a little bit. If you don't want to operate at all, you don't have to. Um, although if you really don't like operating, I guess ophthalmology may not be the best choice for you. Um, but there are ophthalmologists who don't operate if they if they're getting older or they, they're doing neuro-ophthalmology or some sort of specialty that doesn't operate as much. So again, to go a little more specific, last Monday is what I did. I typically get up around 5.30. Um, I live outside of the city, so I have to drive in. Um, we have lecture most days, seven to eight. Um, and then the first thing I did was go into the operating room. I did one cataract case. Uh, so it actually didn't take from eight to 12. I was scheduled from that. Then I came down to clinic. I saw patients. I saw about eight patients that day. Uh, and then at around six o'clock, we finished writing all the notes. We finished, you know, setting up all the appointments and scheduling things and all the logistical stuff that comes up during the day and you go home. Um, now another benefit of ophthalmology is that we take home call. So home, there's different types of being on call. You probably hear a lot of different doctors talk about this. Uh, if you're on call, that basically means that someone could call you at any time with some sort of medical thing that you need to be able to take care of. Um, but the, you can have in-house call where you have to physically be in the hospital. And those are for things that require sort of immediate attention. So for example, if you're in the intensive care unit for recovering you know, nurse, nurse surgery, you need to be in-house because you need to be able to respond to things within a very short period of time. Thankfully for ophthalmology, there aren't as many of those things that need to be required like super quickly. So if there's an emergency that comes in the hospital, we generally need to be there within an hour or so. Um, and that's only for a handful of emergencies. Um, most, a lot of things we can deal with over the phone. So if someone calls and says, hey, we have this problem. We don't know what's going on. You can say, well, I'll try this. Um, and have them come to the clinic in the morning. Um, but um, so it's a little bit of a nice thing that we can get to be home when we're on call. And as you get older, when you're a junior resident, you end up spending most of the time in the hospital anyway, because it takes time to see patients. Um, you're not necessarily sure which things can be managed without like the next day or which need to be seen that night. So you generally, to be cautious, you just like see everyone quickly. Oh, this is what I did. And you spent a lot of nights in the hospital and that can be kind of annoying because you work one day, full day, you work that night, the overnight, you have to work the next day. So you're working two to six hours straight um, and that can be pretty tiring. 
Um, but as you become an attending, then you're not really taking primary call. And that means is, you know, someone else is going to be doing all the, the, the work of seeing the patient, figuring out what's going on, examining the patient. Then they'll call you and they'll say, this is what's going on. What do you want to do? And then you're just, you're taking call and you still have to respond and make decisions, but it's less intensive from a time perspective. And one thing to consider when you're thinking about what residency you want to do is how much call you want to do, what the type of call looks like and how that call changes as you're attending. Because for some specialties, you're still on call and you still have to come in a lot in the middle of the night. Um, and it is nice in a sense when someone has an acute issue and that they call you and that's something you're able to help with. That is, you know, kind of a, a nice thing about being a medicine that you're able to help people. Um, but it, it can be difficult to deal with if it's happening a lot. And if it's in, if it's in something that you don't truly enjoy, you just have to know how much you're going to have to do it. Um, so I think we're in pretty good time here. Let me, um, Oh, sorry, is there a question in the chat here? Oh, the textbook is called the Basic Clinical Sciences uh, Course, and it's made by the AEO, it's the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, some residencies, our residency like buys it for us. Um, some places don't, um, but it's really nice. It's pretty like, it is a textbook, but it's not very like stuffy. It's, um, it just goes through all of these, there's lots of good pictures. I'm gonna pull up the video here and I'll talk you all through it. Um, did anyone else have any, any questions about you know day in the life, what things look like clinic-wise, OR-wise? There are some questions, but we'll save them for the Q&A session. Okay, sounds good. Um, can you see my screen again? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So what we do when we do the surgery, I know the other doctor showed a video, uh, it's not a video, an animation. Um, so that's why I want to show an actual video because I think it's nice. Uh, so I'm sitting on the left side of the patient with the patient's left eye and their forehead is on the right of the screen. So their nose is like on the top of the screen, right? Um, their pupil is dilated. You can see that's the green part. And so the pupil is very big and the lens, when you shine a bright light on the eye, all the retina reflects and causes what we call a red reflex. And that's sometimes if you like take a picture of someone and their eye looks white or red, that's what you're seeing. Um, so that's what we're doing here. It gives us a lot of light to look. Um, so first thing we do is we make a small uh, paracentesis blade. This is a 0.12 millimeter uh, blade. And this helps us make a small incision. And then we're gonna inject something that helps keep the inside of the eye formed uh, as we're doing the rest of the surgery. Because otherwise it could collapse and that can cause things to move around and scar and break. Um, so make that small incision. And you'll see, uh, you'll see me using what's called a, a fixation ring. So we use it's something to essentially hold the eye in place. So this is using that stabilizing material. It's kind of like a gel. Uh, it's filling up the eye. And before I stop here, just to, to clarify, this is again, cataract surgery. So if I just sketch out the parts here, so if we're looking at this from the side, your cataract looks like this, connected. Um, it's in a very thin capsule that's uh, about 10, five to 10 microns thick. Um, and to do the surgery, we want to remove the lens that's on the inside without breaking the capsule on the outside. And so what we do is we make a small incision on either side of the capsule, remove this front part, which is the next part you'll see. Then we go in with the probe, we break up this lens and we remove it. Um, and to break it up, we're going to break it up into four chunks, split it into the four different chunks, remove each chunk separately, just because it's easier that way. And then you'll see that we'll inject a nuclear plastic lens. So here we go. So we made that first incision. Now we're going to make our main incision, and this incision is 2.2 millimeters across. Um, the operating scope you're under, I think, is 10 times magnification. Um, or maybe six. So again, this is the main blade and we make a tunneled incision. So you notice I just don't go straight in. If you go straight in, it'll create a wound, you know, that, that cut's gonna keep leaking. Um, so we do a tunnel incision so it self seals. And then through this main incision, we have a little bit of width that we can work our instruments with. Um, so the next step, like I said, we're gonna make that small circular incision on the, the front part of the capsule, which is that bag that's holding the lens in. And so you'll see me 
uh, come in. This is a, a bent scissor attempt. So it's essentially a needle that's bent so that we can use it to kind of make our first cut. And in the uh, in this process, like I was saying, um, there are a lot of different other steps and different ways of doing this. But I think it's nice to see, like if you were to shadow us in the OR, this is what you would be seeing. Um, so that's why I wanted to show a video like this of, of me operating. It's a little bit hard to see this, but there's a little bit of a flap. I'm not sure how well this is coming through. Can you see, like, there's a break I made there, and there's a little bit of flap of this lens material, of the capsule material right here. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this. So that's really what you should be looking at. It's very faint. Um, but then what we do is we grab that flap and we pull it around to make that circular opening in the front. And it'll, be, it'll become more clear as I'm pulling it across. So these are tiny forceps. I have a little bend on the end that help you grab that flap. And you just sort of reach, the, reach in, gently try to grab it. And if you pull too hard, the center of the eye, um, if you pull too hard, this capsule is, is very thin, it's just gonna break. And if it, if it breaks, then the whole lens is gonna be very unstable. So you have to be careful to try to make it a nice smooth round incision on the front, but smooth round opening, I should say. So now you can see the flap better, I think. And if you look at the more peripheral rim, that's the one that I'm going to try to pull around and keep it nice and smooth. And like I said, if you have questions about what's going on surgery-wise, feel free to ask them as, as we're going through. And one of the nice things about ophthalmology surgically is it's um it, it's what I guess technically type of microsurgery. So it, it's you're using a lot of small movements. You have to rotate your hand and rotate your fingers, um, and it's it's very satisfying to to work on things like this. Um, that's that's one of the things I really enjoy. Probably in operating is my favorite part of of ophthalmology. So we've got a pretty good opening here. It's not quite open all the way. Um, so I'm just gonna skip to the end of this part and then go to the part where I'm introducing the ultrasound probe, the fake emulsification probe to break up the lens. Um, before we do that, we inject a little bit of, of water under the lens capsule to help separate the lens from the lens capsule. And you'll see the water kind of float all the way around to the back of the eye, to the back of the lens, sorry. So this is a little, a tiny little cannula and there's saline attached to the other end. So I slide the saline across the front part of the lens under the capsule and then do what's called hydro dissection. So dissecting the lens with water. You'll see that now. There we go. So now you see that change in color in the back. That's the water going along the back of the lens, dissecting it. And this will allow the lens to come forward without being attached to the back of the bag. Um, one of the things you worry about during cataract surgery is if you break the back of the bag, then you're opening the lens and you're exposing the lens to the vitreous, which is one of the other structures I talked about. And that um, makes it hard to put in a new plastic lens because it can be a little unstable. And it increases the infection risk because now if anything gets into the front of the eye, you can get to the back of the eye and cause infection. And if anything in the back of the eye, um, if there's any, anything pulling on the retina, it can cause retinal attachment, it can cause swelling. Um, so again, you really try to minimize that. So now the lens has come up out of the bag a little bit and I'm actually trying to push it back and make sure it's mobile. So you saw that it rotated. So now we know the lens is out and it's mobile and we can move it without being worried that it's gonna affect the posterior capsule or the back of the bag like I talked about. So here is the ultrasound probe or what we call the fake emulsification probe. Um, it rotates really, really quickly and to break up the lens without um, moving it too much. And that way we can get the kind of the fat lens out of a small hole. Um, the smaller incision we make, the better in terms of healing and you know, post-operative refraction. So the smaller wound is, as you can imagine, it's less disruptive. So this probe lets us use a very small wound and instead just break up the lens into little tiny pieces that can then be sucked out. So it has an aspiration port. So essentially a vacuum in the middle. And so as the lens is being broken up, it's also sucking it out of the eye. And as I mentioned before, what we do is we 
break it up into quadrants. So I'm going to slice down this first half, and then I'm going to crack. As soon as I slice down into the middle, then I insert a second instrument to the other um, cut I made and break the lens in half. And here you can get a sense of the sort of depth of the lens. It's about five, roughly five millimeters thick. So there's a second instrument set going in and you sort of gently pull it apart and you can see the nice crack coming. And now we have two halves. And once we have it in two halves, then we're going to essentially repeat the process on each half. So we have quadrants, and the quadrants are going to be easier to break up. Um, if you keep the lens in one trunk and try to remove it all like that, if it moves up and down, it can tear the bag. So the smaller trunks, it's a little bit safer to remove. So we do the same thing. We make a little groove. Um, and you can't go too far in the groove because then you'll hit the, the bag. Um, but if you don't go far enough, then it's not going to be able to crack. So it's a little bit of a balance there. And I should say, when you're, when you're um, starting off in ophthalmology, the first surgeries you do are the ones on the eye muscles and the eyelids. You do that as a first year, at least. And it depends on where you go, but roughly that's true at the University of Maryland. Um, your first year, you do those two surgeries, and you're doing what's called primary surgery. It means you're doing pretty much all the main steps. Um, and then at the end of your second year, you start doing surgeries like this, intraocular surgeries, including cataract surgery, some glaucoma surgery, maybe um, a small amount of parental surgery. Um, and then at the as you're a senior and you have experience doing all those things, then you really start to ramp up your surgical volume and you do a lot of these. So this past year, I did about 25. Um, but then this coming year, hopefully I'll, I'll do close to 150. Um, and it's nice because that, that makes you more comfortable in the operating room because it, it can be very um, challenging and sort of uh, stressful. To, to be in a position um, where you're operating like this, um, but you do feel comfortable and you have a lot of really good surgical teachers. Um, you'll notice that I'm operating with someone directly next to me who's a, a, a great, great teacher, a great surgeon. Um, and they're there to like make sure what you're doing is right. You move nice and slow. And if anything, you know, if expect it were to happen, which can happen at any time during any surgery, um, they're there to help guide you through it and, and make sure everything turns out okay. Now we turn up the power. And you can see the, that lens is really just melting the different quadrants. And then now you can really see, you see how that, that red, what we call it red reflex is much clearer in the back. That's because now all that light that that cloudy cataract lens is blocking is now getting through. And so that's, that's all the cloudiness that we're removing from the eye. And now that we remove the first half, we'll rotate through, remove the second half. So we've managed to remove the bulk of the lens now. And now we're, we're going to switch probes to a sort of a gentler probe that doesn't have as much, it doesn't have any ultrasound power. It's actually just aspirating and irrigating. So it just has some suction. And it's safer because it's not, it's not going to cut through anything that we don't want it to. Um, but it's still going to remove some of that residual cortex. So some of the peripheral part of the lens that's left, you can see those kind of irregular areas where it's not like pure red, but there's kind of like some kind of fluff there. We're going to go through and just kind of pull that off gently. And so again, this is what we call an irrigation aspiration port. There's a vacuum on that, that little circle that you can see is a vacuum, so it's pulling things into it. And then there's two little holes on either side that you may not be able to see as well that the fluid is flowing in. And so you just point that your aspiration port at all the residual lens material. And you can see it kind of just very gently moving around and it pulls, it pulls the rest of it out and sucks it out of the eye.
this card could be really challenging, especially the part under the main incision, um, because you have to hold your instrument gently, rotate it, rotate it within your fingers, and also rotate your wrist so that you're kind of diving under your main wound. Um, it was one of the kind of the challenging parts, at least when I, for me when I was starting off. That's a nice big chunk there. That's pretty much it. Um, I can skip forward a little bit to the part where we actually get the lens, the new lens in. So you can see it's nice, nice clear reflex. There's not really any cloudiness left in, inside the eye because we got all the cataract out. Um, and there's a lot of details in the lenses, um, but they're pretty much what you look like. They're made of acrylic, they're soft plastic lenses, um, and we measure them to be the right one for the patient's eye. And then we inject it into the wound. They're rolled up into the injector. So again, put up into that small incision. And then once they get inside the eye, it unfolds. So you'll see it there unfold, unfolding. And we make sure we sort of inject it into the part of the eye where the old lens was inside the capsule. And it has two little arms on either side of it that press onto the capsule and keep it in the right place. And then the center is that nice circular lens. And here I'm just kind of repositioning just to make sure it's right in the center. That's pretty much it. The only, the only two steps is we remove some of the other um, last, some of the other sort of gel material we use to stabilize the egg. We remove that. Um, and then we make sure that the incisions you made are sealed. And if they weren't sealed, um, if they were too big or if they were leaky for some reason, we may have to put a couple stitches in. But thankfully in this situation, we don't. And that's about it. The patient did thankfully very well after this. So let's stop there. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad. We will now begin um, our, our Q&A session. Thank you so much for your mentorship. That was definitely an interesting surgery to watch and helped me kind of understand ophthalmology a little bit better. So um, Abdullah, I'll pass it over to you. All right. So, um, starting off with the first question, um, I've noticed that eye anatomy is tested profusely uh, on the MCAT. And uh, I've spoken to a couple of uh, medical uh, school students um, who say they don't really learn a lot about like um, eye anatomy as, as in depth as um, other organ systems. So, uh, what inspired you to uh, study? Um, uh, I have a hard time pronouncing it. Ophthalmology. Yeah, ophthalmology. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. I was a little bit of, it was a couple of things. One, I, when I was trying to decide whether I wanted to do medicine, I shattered a couple of different doctors. And one of the ones was someone um, was an ophthalmologist. Uh, and so it was a little bit of kind of chance in that sense because I, I saw it and I kind of was exposed to it early on. Because you're right, you don't really get much exposure to it otherwise. And like I said, a lot of people, even in medical school, if they're interested in ophthalmology, they might not know until later on, or they may not know at all until, you know, and, and they may decide to take a year off to do extra research or something to prepare their application. Um, but I think it's a good idea just in general to really cast a wide net in terms of things you think you might be interested in, because it's always good to try and say, oh, this isn't for me, then to figure out too late. Um, so when you're an undergrad, that means shadowing in medicine for sure, but also shadowing things, other things you might consider. So, you know, let's say you think you really want to be a doctor, you should really ask yourself, like, what other other things I might want to do, um, and try to cast a wide net. So, like I said, you know, if you want to shadow some sort of like immigration firm or a lawyer or business or whatever, cast a wide net. Um, and same thing once you start medical school and you say, well, I think I want to be, you know, a medicine doctor. Um, but then really ask yourself, like, what are the other specialties available? Are any of these at all interesting to me? And if so, once you're in medical school, it becomes thankfully relatively easy. You can like. Uh, your faculty are very supportive and you can just ask someone be like, oh, this is something I'm interested in. Can I get some experience? Can you connect with someone? And then they'll be able to, to help to facilitate that. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and I understand that you went to uh, NYU for medical school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, I heard their tuition is free for their medical students. So I, I was just wondering what are like the advantages and like disadvantages of attending NYU? Uh, NYU is great. I mean, so I, uh, when I applied, so my last year, thankfully, they announced the free tuition. So my last year was free, which is I'm very thankful for. Um, 
So the advantage is when you're thinking about the type of medical school you want to go to, um, location, like actually just the physical location is one thing. And, you know, I'm from Maryland. I want to stay close to home. I don't want to go too far. So that's, that's important. I think it's something to consider the type of, the type of place it is. So New York is definitely a big city. Um, most medical schools are in some cities, but some are in big cities, some are in small cities, some are in medium-sized cities. A few of them are in some more kind of like rural environments. Uh, and I think if you have an idea of what type of environment you want to practice in, both geographic area, like for example, if you want to practice in the Northeast, it makes sense to do your residency in the Northeast and your medical school in the Northeast. Um, but if you want to practice in a small area, it doesn't make sense to do your residency in a big city. Um, and the last thing is uh, the, the sort of the specific resources that a university has. So if you're deciding new places and you have an idea of a certain specialty you want to go into, and one of them has a big, for example, one of them has a big ophthalmology department, uh, and some places don't have ophthalmology departments, that's something you should consider and look and say, do the, do the people who graduate from this medical school go into the specialty that I want to go into? And pretty much every medical school has that published. Um, and you'll see, you know, if you're like, again, you want to go to ophthalmology, I might want to look how many patients, I mean, how many um, graduates match into ophthalmology or how many graduates mm -hmm. match into, you know, whatever I want to go into. And those are the things that, to consider. Medical school curriculum, I mean, you're going to learn what you need to learn at, at its core, um, but it's kind of those kind of smaller things that can vary. Interesting. So, I mean, would you say like the NYU curriculum, like kind of like pushed you towards um, like studying ophthalmology? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the, the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, the, there's, like I said, there's two parts of the curriculum. There's what they call uh, clinical and preclinical. Preclinicals, which you start off with, is pretty much just classes and lectures and things. Um, and that's very, very standard. Um, the old school way of doing it was they would kind of go through anatomy and physiology and those things. And then in your first year, and then in your second year, they go to pathophysiology. So they start introducing diseases and go through, you know, all different types of diseases. Um, but more recently, most places do an organ systems approach. So they'll just say, okay, this, this month we're going about the heart. And you learn about all that heart anatomy, how the heart works, heart diseases, heart medications, heart treatments, everything about the heart. And then you move on. Okay, next, next month we're going about the lungs and stuff. So that's how they did it at NYU. Um, mm -hmm. We had sort of an anatomy section, and then we kind of went through organ system by organ system. Uh, again, they don't really teach you that much about ophthalmology mm -hmm. um, during that, but you can get exposure to that on your own if you wanted to. Um, and then the clinical portion, you rotate through all the major clinical specialties that include internal medicine, general surgery, you know, obstetrics, gynecology, labor delivery, pediatrics, uh, stuff like that. Again, ophthalmology is not included. You can do it as an elective, but it depends on what you're interested in because there are other electives available like radiology, emergency medicine, you might not you might want to go into it, but you want to get experience on early on. Interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, without that, especially with like COVID, um, you know, everyone stayed inside, you know, there's, um, there's an increased like amount of people just spending time on like the internet, like the whole day. So um, what were some significant changes uh, you have observed to eye health during that time? There's a couple of things. So a, a lot of things happened during COVID, you know, our eye clinics, I was actually doing internal medicine at the time. So I wasn't there for most of it. Mm -hmm. Eye clinics were shut down. Um, and so there were some patients who, you know, needed treatment so they couldn't get and their eye condition got worse. That was one thing that happened. Um, in terms of people using their phones and things more, there's not really good evidence that spending a lot of time on your phone causes permanent eye damage. Um, if you're young, uh, it can, if you're young, it can cause you to be more nearsighted. So you need to take the glasses, even more negative prescription. Um, and that's something that they're really seeing like generationally wise, like our generation or younger generations are like progressively more and more short-sighted, nearsighted. Um, and there's some different theories, like maybe that's spending a lot of time inside or a lot of times on computers or reading, um, and less time outside in the sunlight. So it's good if you have, if you're like around young kids, or I guess for you yourselves, like make sure you spend time outside and like do things in the sun to stop that uh but how much how how much spending time on your computer really directly hurts the eye it's really not much you know you can be a little uncomfortable and it's good to take breaks um but it doesn't without permanent damage all right well thank you very much uh, i'll pass um i'll pass it over to hamza uh for the remainder of our qa thank you very much of course thank you thank you very much for your mentorship and teaching dr mohammed uh i will continue the q a from here uh, my name is Hamza, and I'm a student at Seton Hill University, and I'm doing a joint BSDO program with the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, both of which are in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, the first question I'm going to ask is something that relates to me. So I saw on your LinkedIn that you have a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I recently started jiu-jitsu myself. I actually have my gi right with me. Nice. Um, might be eaten up by the uh, background filter, but I have it. And in my research, I saw that it could take up to 10 years to become a black belt. So something I've always wondered is how do you train jiu-jitsu, you know, during medical school, during residency? Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Just martial arts in general, how, hobbies yeah. in general. Sure. So I've been, I've been, so I should say first that my black belt is not in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's in a, it's an organization that has karate and Jiu Jitsu, but it's more like Japanese Jiu Jitsu. Um, but I've been in karate since I was five, so it's been about 20 years. And uh, it, I did a lot, especially in high school and college. Um, I was going multiple nights a week, you know, probably in high school, maybe three or four nights a week for a couple hours. And then in college, same, same way. Um, that was really where I did most of my training. Um, once you're in medical school, it does become harder. For one, I was in a different area, so I couldn't train with the people I normally trained with. So whenever I came home, I would still go and practice and do those things. Um, it's also, like, as I was saying in the earlier talk, it's really important when you're in college to sort of establish the habits of, um, you know, general physical health, including uh, or general health outside of medicine, which for me includes, I think for everyone should include some sort of physical activity. And so if you establish a routine of training, you know, working out a couple hours a week, or a couple of days a week for an hour or two, um, whether you're doing lifting or karate or jiu-jitsu or, you know, other sports like tennis, you know, any, any kind of sport, anything physical. Once you establish that as an undergrad, it's easier. It makes it easier to keep it going. Even when you're busy, even if you're working, you know, 12 hours a day, you're working on nights, you can still always find an hour or two to work out. Um, so you might not be able to train as hard as you used to or as much as you used to, but you'll definitely always be able to keep training as long as you make an effort to do it. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. The second question is back into the more medical side of things. Uh, I know that transplant patients often have to take immunosuppressants to prevent, you know, their transplanted organs from attacking themselves, so from the immune system attacking those organs. So is that also the case when the cornea is transplanted or when there's procedures done with the eye? Is there a similar situation? Yeah. So the eye is what's called an immune privilege site, meaning that there's a little bit of a, of a barrier between systemic um, immunology and the eye based on just the anatomy and the structure of the eye. Um, but you still, for example, someone has a coronary transplant, we do put them on topical immunosuppressive medications, mostly in the form of steroids, um, and that you can get graft rejection. And so the graft can, can start to die if, it's, if the immune system is not locally suppressed. You don't need to be on systemic immunosuppression like they are for like liver or lung transplants. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that for people who do have graft versus associated disease, which is that kind of disease response you get when you have a, a transplanted organ, your body starts to reject it, that can manifest in the eye. Um, and you can get different types of dry ocular graft versus host disease from say, again, like a transplanted kidney or liver or something. Right, thank you very much. That was really informational. Um, here's a question overall about what you do. What is your favorite surgical procedure to do? Is it cataract surgery or is it something else? Yeah, it's definitely cataract surgery. I mean, as I was saying, we're sort of like you kind of build through your surgical skills and you start off doing some of the extra ocular surgeries. And I, I really enjoyed those. Um, but there's, there's something I re personally really enjoy about doing intraocular surgery. Um, and there are many different types of intraocular surgery. Cataract surgery is sort of, it's not the most simple, but it is the one you kind of start learning on that you do earliest on. So there's a lot that I haven't done yet. Um, and that I, I think there may be something that I enjoy more or something that I really enjoy. But for now, that's what I would say. Cataract surgery. It's, it's, it's very, um, it's also a very rewarding surgery that you really directly, it's, it's very, um, you get a quick result, you know, like someone doesn't see while well you do the surgery and really within a couple of days, that's so much thing better. That's, that's very rewarding too, very humble. Thank you very much. Uh, this following question comes from the user Sherry Ann about cataract surgery mm -hmm. uh, and surgical video. She asked, how does the tunnel uh, incision work and how does it help the self heal? Also, how do you suture? How do you do sutures on the eye? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I wonder if I can draw. Let's see. I'll draw it a little bit because I think it'll help show what's what's going on. Right. Um, are you going to be sharing? Right, yeah. Okay, so if we're looking at the cornea from the side, it looks kind of like that. That's some thickness to it. 
And so if you make a regular incision, you just go straight through like that. Uh, but what we do when you make a tunnel incision is you first, you enter perpendicular to the cornea, then you come up parallel to the cornea, then you go through again like that. So the end incision looks like that. And so you can see how this helps seal because essentially this, when, when things when it pushes against here, it pushes here and that stops the fluid from going through. Whereas if it was just a straight line, you know, if something pushes here, there's nothing stopping the fluid from coming all the way out or fluid going in. Um, and then to answer your second question about how we do sutures on the eye, um, there's a couple of different types of sutures. You know, if we're suturing on the cornea, you use a very small, obviously very small needle and a very small suture. So we use 10 nylon typically. Um, and we just make a small pass, go straight through like that. And then we, you know, you tie it off. Uh, so you, you just have to do it in the scope. And you, you know, it, it takes a lot of practice to be able to do one kind of properly. Um, we do other sutures, you know, if we make a cut on other parts of the eye, there are different types of suture materials we use, um, but the, the basic principles are pretty much the same. Use a, you know, a small forceps, a, a needle driver, a needle holder that helps us pass the suture and then you tie it off. Thanks, Dr. Tariq. Yeah, that answered my question. Good, yeah, of course. Yep, I'd also like to thank you for answering that question. Uh, many ophthalmologic, ophthalmologic sur surgeries tend to have low risk and high satisfaction rates. What are some common post-surgical complications that can occur, occur after surgery, though? And I know that you mentioned infection, but is there anything else specifically you want to talk about? Yeah, infection is one of the big ones, but there, there are a lot of complications um, that can happen after surgery. Like you said, I do think one of the advantages of ophthalmology, or one of the nice things about ophthalmology, is that the surgery is generally low risk and um, generally turns out well. What we say for cataract surgery is about 99 out of 100. Um, have no complications. Um, of course, the exact number kind of varies, but yeah, so infection is one of the most concerning ones we talk about. Infection that's untreated can really damage and destroy the eye. Um, you can get some post-operative bleeding or like a uh, swelling in the back of the eye. Both of those that tend to be able to be treated are not necessarily often as serious. Um, you can get renal detachments after cataract surgery. You can get hypotony or low eye pressure, or very high eye pressure. Um, so you can get uh, you can also get a bad reaction to the steroid drops or other drops that can cause higher pressure. So really the list of complications is very, very long. Um, those are the common ones. Uh, having cataract surgery can also, depending on the type of anesthesia they use or how they prepare for the surgery, can cause double vision, excuse me, can affect the eye muscles, can affect the eyelid position. Um, I'm trying to think. So those, those are the, those are the those are the common ones. In in very bad situations, you can have a complication. You can have complications that can really cause blindness. Um, if someone has a really bad hemorrhage in the wrong area, the eye can get very swollen. Um, and again, that's very uncommon, but it is possible. Thank you very much for that answer as well. And our final question is something that relates to me because I'm somebody who wears glasses. Um, what are your recommended best practices for protecting vision and eye health? Um, in general, it's what's good for your general health is what's good for your eye health, you know? Um, so that means, so the things that you can avoid, you know, if you avoid getting systemic conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, I know we all are young and you're probably not thinking about it, but those are very common and they, they happen. Um, so if you establish those habits of eating well, working out, um, that's good for your general health and that'll be good for your eye health. Things that think specific to your eye, obviously if you have any actual eye issues, it's good to check in with an eye doctor, get a full eye exam. Um, if you have any family history of any eye disease, that's especially a good reason, like glaucoma, macular degeneration, or other things. Those things definitely run in family. So if you have things like that, definitely get an eye doctor exam, get checked out, make sure you don't have any issues like that. Um, in terms of like dealing with eye strain and things like that, once you're you know, on the computer a lot, studying a lot, what we say is if you're looking at something up close for 20 minutes, Every 20 minutes, it's good to take a break for about 20 seconds and look at something that's far away, um, just to give your eyes a little bit of, of rest. So, you know, you're on a computer, look out the window for a little bit, take a little break. Um, it's good for your eyes and it looks good for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. These are all the questions we have for today. Okay, of course. And I, I put my email at the bottom there. So, well, I guess the, the slides changed, but you feel free to send it out. If anyone has any questions, you want to reach out to me, just, just let me know. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer all of our questions and taking the time out of your day to mentor us. So I'd like everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Muhammad in the chat box for this incredibly informative session. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. So the link to the quiz for the session is now live and you'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. And the link to the quiz is being sent in the chat now. And for our next session dates, which will also be posted throughout our social media outlets, so be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. Our next session will be next Saturday, June 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with our physician mentoring us in cardiothoracic surgery. Thank you so much everyone for attending today's session and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. This concludes this week's shadowing.